It is a pleasure to welcome you uh, in my role as the Chair of the Faculty of Music to the first colloquium of the new academic year. It's a particular honour to introduce Professor Nicholas Marston for his inaugural lecture to mark his recent election to a personal chair at the University of Cambridge as Professor of Music Theory and Analysis. As many of you in this room will know, Nick Marston's research interests range across Beethoven manuscript studies, theory and analysis, Schumann, and the history of the Choral Foundation at King's College, where he is Vice Provost, Choir Lector, and Director of Studies in Music. He is the author of Heinrich Schenker and Beethoven's Hammer Clavier Sonata, published by Ashgate in 2013, a contributor to Schenker Documents Online, former chairman of the editorial board of the Journal of Music Analysis, and former editor-in-chief of the Beethoven Forum. The title of his paper today, as you can see behind me, is Neurine Likeness, Heinrich Schenker, and the Path to Likeness. Well, thank you, Sam, for that uh, generous introduction and to all of you for turning up this afternoon. Uh, I'd like to thank also, and she appears on cue, Rachel Stroud for uh, assisting me in learning the mysteries of PowerPoint. Uh, so when it goes wrong, you know who to blame. She's just over there. Uh, and I'd like to play, before starting, I'd like to play my, uh, my sort of get out of jail card straight away by saying that what uh, I'm presenting to you this afternoon is very much work in progress. It's new material. I haven't presented it anywhere else. And so I shall be uh, interested, uh, as always, in your responses. It's now more than 30 years since William Pastille, in a brief article published in 19th Century Music in 1984, brought to our attention Schenker's essay Der Geist der Musikalischen Technik, The Spirit of Musical Technique. First published in seven installments in the Leipzig Musikalisches Wochenblatt in May and June 1895, the complete text subsequently appeared as a separate off-print of which you can see an image on the screen. And at the foot of the front cover of this off print, the publisher, Fritsch, who was himself editor of the Wochenblatt, repeated two details which had accompanied the first installment. One, that Geist, as I shall refer to it hereafter, had been delivered as a lecture to the Philosophical Society of the University of Vienna, and that it formed part of a larger work that was still in manuscript. I shall eventually return to both of these points. For the moment, I want to summarize the content of the essay for those of you who don't perhaps keep it as your daily bedside, bedside reading. In section one, untitled, uh, but which, uh, pas to which Pastille gives the title Melody, Schenker initially attributes the first musical expression to the innate properties of the larynx and vocal cords and suggests that elevated sentiments were voiced spontaneously in music while plain speech without musical tones sufficed for humdrum emotions and other routine functions. Subsequently, singing must have developed into song for song's sake, as he called it, unmotivated by immediate stimuli. Later again, humans found the means to make mental representations and images of objects and emotions the basis of musical expression. From this, Schenker posits two creative principles for music, one deriving from the response to external stimuli, the other, the more underrated, he says, even ridiculed nowadays, arising from a purely internal desire for activity, which Schenker calls the formal principle of creation. Very loosely, we might say that Schenker is here differentiating programmatic from absolute music. The latter is the more difficult to cultivate, owing to the tendency for this kind of music to tend towards what he calls randomness and incoherence, excess and aimlessness. The attempt to combat these pitfalls led to music's attempt to adopt the habits of language, to learn to suggest convincingly the impression of self-contained thought. Thus, there eventually arose the concept of melody, a series of tones that demanded to be understood and felt as a whole, as a self-contained idea, as Schenker puts it. 
Nevertheless, music could never fully match the force of verbal language since it, since it is fundamentally ignorant of causality or logic. At the heart of section two, Pastille's title is repetition, is the crucial importance in textless instrumental music of the principle of repetition, Wiederholung. Unnecessary in those arts which relate events and stories, where things generally happen only once, repetition was vital to intelligibility in an art form to which the representation of concepts and things in the natural world was forbidden. For as long as music allied itself to language, its comprehensibility, or a semblance thereof, was guaranteed by the linguistic component itself. But the musical motive, unlike the word, is not a sign for something else. As Schenker says, it is nothing more and nothing less than itself. Melodic or motivic repetition, therefore, was a unique and reliable principle of organization, which suggested that music and language had developed independently of one another much earlier than supposed. Moreover, instrumental music, organized according to purely musical principles, was likely to have emerged well before the 16th century, when Schenker thought that musicians began that epochal cultivation whose fruits we enjoy today. The discussion of repetition leads naturally enough into that of polyphony in section 3, although Schenker doesn't make the connection explicit. Polyphony, he says, entered Western music as a purely musical principle. It is the one artifice, Gützlichkeit, that music can no longer forego. Polyphony gave rise to counterpoint, an utterly unique, historically conditioned and continually evolved, ev evolving method of training. And Schenker then develops an analogy between the school of counterpoint and that of mechanical finger dexterity for the performer. A general and unspecific facility in contrapuntal technique prepares the composer's imagination to see countless different dispositions and transformations of a theme, from which the best and most appropriate may eventually be selected. Once selected and adopted within an individual composition, however, contrapuntal technique becomes equally subjective as the mood sphere, the Stimmungskreis, of the work. Section 4 concerns harmony. Here, Schenker suggests that the ancient Greek understanding of the term coincided with the melody itself and asserts the principle, now lost to music theory, he thinks, that every melody possesses a harmony of its own. Then, foreshadowing much in his later writing, he lays at Rameau's door the current, very narrow understanding of the function of harmony as being to interpret melody to provide the mot motivation for the relationships among the individual tones of the melody. Schenker, however, sees harmony's support to melody in more negative terms. Referring back to the discussion in section one, he claims that just as melody lays claim to a causality and logic which it doesn't truly possess, so too does harmony, which acts as if it contains within itself the force of logic a self-deception which has become hallowed by tradition and habit. Acting together, harmony and melody achieve with doubled intensity that faux sense of necessity and logic to which instrumental music aspires. And all this leads to the concluding final section, section five, which in Schenker's own title, Moods, Forms and the Organic, which is the most well-known and notorious part of Geist. Here, Schenker first considers the role of repetition in creating mood and the position of composer and listener in sustaining and understanding this, as well as the role of repetition in creating more extended musical structures. A process whereby all that had been multifarious became consolidated, while that which had been similar became differentiated, led eventually to the establishment of the so-called forms and rendered to music an artificiality which was the opposite of what Schenker considered its intrinsic nature, namely that of creating melodies individually. That said, he immediately qualified his use of the term Künstlichkeit, distancing himself from the derogatory connotation commonly imputed to it. Music's artificiality wasn't to be openly paraded, however. On the contrary, the composer's task was to convey the impression of the artificial whole as something generated naturally. 
Gradually, the constant striving to, con to create the sense of a whole led listeners to the impression that the artificial constructs had the same sort of necessity possessed by natural organisms. In a word, and I quote Schenker here, the highest praise that can be rendered to a musical artwork now nowadays is to say that it is constructed organically, and Schenker uses that word in quotes. It's Schenker's attitude to organicism that has made Geist such a well-known and discussed part of his published work. For while on the basis of his later and best known work, Schenker has long been considered, in Ruth Soli's phrase, the organicist par excellence, Geist revealed him to be quite the opposite. Here are two of the most famous uh, quotations bearing on this point. As a matter of fact, no musical content is organic. It lacks any principle of causation, and a contrived melody never has a determination so resolute that it can say, only that particular melody and none other may follow me. And again, strictly speaking, the material of musical content never arises organically, but rather the composer's teleological intent is to bring it about that the arrangement of proportions and the order of moods which were generated and ultimately cast in final form by him should be judged from the perspective of the organic. Admittedly, Schenker is quick to point out that many who use the term organic do not do so in a strict scientific sense, but rather as a supreme complement to music which gives them great satisfaction. That is, the music gives them great satisfaction, not using the term organic gives them great satisfaction. <laughs> And he notes wryly that while there is no reason why poor quality music might not be organically constructed, no one ever seems to think that this is the case. And there's one situation, not acknowledged by Pastille in his commentary on the essay, in which he is prepared to accept that music might be deemed organic sensu stricto. And this is when the imagination, after it has generated a particular pattern, is positively besieged by many patterns similar in nature, and that the influence of these similar patterns on the composer is often so irresistible that he includes them in the developing content without having become aware at all of their similarity. But this organic element remains organic only so long as it does not become contaminated by consciousness, and the moment the composer directs his imagination toward the hunt for similarities, then that which otherwise could have seemed organic to us devolves into the merely thematic, that is, into intentional similarity. A particular similarity has actually arisen organically in the imagination only as in as much as the composer has not intended it. In conclusion, Schenker's view is that to be on the safe side, the organic can therefore only ever be discussed hypothetically. Schenker's take on organicism in Geist has spawned a significant literature, with commentators variously trying to explain away what is seen as his anomalous, anomalous position on this topic, or attempting to show how Schenker's later volt fast concerning organicism in music was achieved. Pastille's own explanation for how the anti-organicist became the arch-organicist hung on Schenker's discovery of the Stufe as a higher abstract unity beyond the musical surface, together with his developing notion of the musical genius, the composer whose creative activity is unconsciously directed by the superior force of truth, of nature, so to speak. Alan Keiler, in 1989, sought to show that Schenker's anti-organicist position was adopted merely in order to refute the formalist stance of Hanslick, and that Schenker was always fundamentally an organicist. A significantly more nuanced argument was developed by Kevin Corsin in a 1993 article showing the influence on Schenker in the 1890s of the twin strands of Austro-German German idealism and scientific empiricism. Corsin returned to the fray in 2009 in an extended response to Nicholas Cook's analysis of Geist in his 2007 book, The Schenker Project. For Cook, the Schenker of Geist was not taking up arms against Hanslick, but rather attempting to build something more systematic and positive upon the basis of the latter's von Musikalisch Schönen. And while he, Cook, doesn't reject Pastille's invocation of the concept of musical genius as a motivating element in Schenker's change of mind, he regards this explanation as an oversimplification, 
finding what he calls the key conceptual leap in the development of Schenker's thinking in a radically new approach to causality conceived, this is Cook's term, axially, from background to foreground, as Schenker would eventually put it, rather than horizontally or linearly. And while he traces what he calls a new confidence in musical logic in Schenker's writings of 1896 to 97, Cook contends that the ultimate solution of the Geist essay's problem over organicism had to wait until the Erläuterungsausgabe of Beethoven's Opus 101 Piano Sonata in 1921. Yet another response to the responses came with Marva Dürksen's 2008 article exploring the pervasive presence of the oppositional pair mechanical and organic in Schenker's thinking in Geist and in subsequent work. And most recently, Robert P. Morgan's book, Becoming Heinrich Schenker, Music Theory and Ideology, published in 2014, devotes a chapter to Geist, confronting Pastille, Keiler and Corsin, and concluding, perhaps more in the spirit of Corsin than Morgan would want to admit, that the essay harbors elements of both anti-organicism and organicism, and that Geist prefigures later developments in Schenker's thought by reformulating the organic-non-organic -organic dichotomy as being the result of two different conceptions of organicism rather than two different conceptions of music, natural versus artificial. All of which brings us to Wednesday, the 12th of October, 2016. And my purpose today isn't so much to subject Geist to further scrutiny, though I will have to refer to it, but rather to ponder the space between its publication in 1895 and that, just over a decade later, in 1906, of Schenker's Harmonielehre, a text which already, I think, reveals a decided shift in his position. This shift is advertised forcefully in the foreword to the main text, where Schenker observes, I believed that I should lay particular emphasis throughout the book on the biological moments in the life of tones. May we at last reconcile ourselves to the idea that tones have a genuine inner life, the animality of which appears more independent of the artist than we dared to assume. The main text then develops this idea. At the outset, Schenker establishes the uniqueness of music as an art form. It alone among the arts manifests no unambiguous association to nature. This lack of association of ideas was, after many centuries, made good by the discovery of the musical motive, which provided music with an innate principle of association, enabling it for the first time to become a genuine art, despite having no prototype in nature. Schenker defines a motive as a sequence of tones that is subject to repetition. Indeed, repetition is fundamental to its identity and definition as a motive. Repetition is to music what the association of ideas to nature is for the other arts. And just as our very concepts, man, tree, and so on, rely upon the replication of man in man, tree in tree, so it is repetition which establishes the motive as an individual in the world of music. Music, like nature itself, manifests a procreative urge. Thus, Schenker says, we should become accustomed to seeing tones as creatures. We should learn to assume biological urges in them, as in living creatures. Thus, the following equation, Gleichung, arises. In nature, we have the procreative urge, which leads to repetition, which leads to the individual type. In music, there is the procreative urge, which leads to repetition, which leads to the individual motive. Obviously, he goes on to say, repetition need not be slavishly literal, nor confined to the melodic realm alone. Schenker mentions rhythm and harmony. And when applied to larger musical units, it gives rise to musical forms. The principle of repetition then enabled music to become, through its own means and without explicit help from nature, an art equal to those others whose basis lies in the association to nature. Finally, in a section of Harmonie Lehrer devoted to what he calls the biological aspect of forms, Schenker draws an analogy between the fate of the musical motives in a composition and that of the characters in a drama. Now, 
All this is a far cry, I think, from Schenker's position on organicism in Geist, even if, as Morgan stresses, the nature-artifice dichotomy established in the earlier text is still prominent and, as Pastille points out, the very words organisch and organismus are almost wholly absent from the vocabulary of Harmonielehre, Schenker preferring other terms. But how did he get from the one to the other? What happened between 1895 and 1906 to bring about this turn in his thinking? I've already mentioned Pastille's explanation in terms of the concept of the Stufe and of the genius, and Cook's view of this as an oversimplification. In his own attempt to identify the point when Schenker came to believe in the possibility of theorizing <coughs> musical organicism, Cook alights upon the unfinished text Über den Niedergang der Komposition, Kompositionskunst, the text of which dates from 1905, and in which the concept of synthesis looms large. Cook entertains the possibility that ideas, particularly concerning cyclic form, which was the term that Schenker used for sonata form around that, ter that time, cyclic form, uh, that ideas which Schenker was struggling to articulate in Niedergang go back before 1905. But at this point, he says, the trail runs cold. The one other substantial piece of unpublished writing, and he's referring to uh, an essay called Das Tonsystem, that may date from the period before Harmonielehre, does not bear on issues of cyclic form, synthesis, or musical logic. Well, let me add another. Among Schenker's many unfinished projects and writings was a new theory of form, a neuer Formenlehre, seemingly first adumbrated in his diary in July 1907. The more than 500 pages of manuscript material associated with this project are preserved in file 83 of the Ernst Oster collection in New York. And Ian Bent suggests that they relate to the first draft of a table referred to in the diary, whether a table of forms or a table of contents, I think is, is, isn't clear. Uh, he, Bent thinks that they relate to that diary entry with, he says, perhaps 10 years of subsequent elaboration. The first of the 11 folders into which the Neue Formenlehre material is organized contain what Bent calls an introductory essay entitled Der Weg zum Gleichnis, the path to likeness in his translation. This essay consists of 36 numbered pages in Schenker's handwriting, in ink and pencil, with three pages interpolated non-sequentially at certain points, and three others, consisting of notes and other material, following at the end. The essay is incomplete and breaks off at the bottom of page 36 with a sentence that may itself be incomplete. It's not entirely clear. Whether the remainder of the essay is preserved, unidentified, elsewhere in the Ulster collection or somewhere else, or whether it hasn't survived isn't presently clear to me. As it stands, the surviving text runs to some six and a half thousand words, including many revisions, rewordings, and restructurings of sentences, supplemented by numerous musical examples written on hand-drawn staves. And the, the overall structure uh, is as follows. We, we don't need to pay too much attention to this, but you see there's a, there's a first title page, De Weg zum Gleichnis, which you just saw, um, a, a section entitled Über das Gleichnis selbst at page 9, then one of these in, inserted pages. On page 22, which we'll see later, uh, was first entitled Conclusion and Translation, and then retitled The Second Secondary Likeness of the Poetic, das zweite sekundäre Gleichnis des Poetischen. An inserted sheet just headed transition between pages 25, 26, and then the three additional sheets at the end. That's, that's the basic structure of this text as it's survived. Um, here are, just so I can do some PowerPoint practice, here are a couple of the inserted pages. This is a, a heading about uh, motive in, um, in, in song, Gesang als Motiv. Um, and another page, again, having to do with, with leader and the question of, of gleichness, of likeness in, in leader. Now, as Bent remarks, no publication of these materials has been attempted since Schenker's death in 1935. And certainly, 
apart from Bent's own references on the Schenker documents uh, website, I'm unaware even of any mention of Der Weg zum Gleichnis in the Schenker literature, though the projected form and Lehrer is well known. I first transcribed Gleichnis, as I'll go on referring to it, some 20 years ago, when my interest was caught by the presence in its pages of a series of examples drawn from the Beethoven piano sonatas, and particularly the first movement of the Hammerklavier. My renewed interest, though, what I'm talking about today, has been sparked by other concerns, and I want now to give you a sense of what this unknown essay contains. Gleichnis opens with the assertion that music, more so even than the other arts, deserves to be considered and lauded as the creation that is most particularly man's own. And this is so, Schenker continues, even though music, unlike poetry, painting and sculpture, is quite without any prototype or purpose drawn from nature. There's a very clear parallel here with chapter 6 of Hans Lick's von Musikalisch Schönen. The sole purpose of art is to resolve nature into the human consciousness. There would seem to be no room for an art that does anything other. And yet from the beginning there has been music which now shares the glory of the other arts. How could this be? asks Schenker. If any of that sounds familiar already, that's as it should be. For as you read the first two sections of Gleichnis, the first 21 pages, it becomes abundantly clear that they're a preliminary and much expanded version of the material that would eventually appear in subsections 1 to 4 of the Harmonielehre, where Schenker more succinctly sets out the unique status of music, the discovery of the motive and motivic repetition as the sub substitute means by which its lack of association to nature can be internally remedied, thereby allowing it to emerge as a genuine art, and then proceeds to illustrate various simple forms of motivic repetition and elaboration, mostly drawn from the Beethoven piano sonatas. Section 2 of Gleichnis asserts that nature had no reason to invent music, and therefore neither did man, being a creature of nature. Thus, while poetry, painting, sculpture and architecture all flourished, Schenker <coughs> specifically cites the Greeks, the ancient Greeks, music did not. Only when it could free itself from poetry and dance, which had hitherto served it as prototype and purpose, to establish itself for its own sake in the purest sense of the word, could music emerge as a true art, possessed of a pure repose in itself, unclouded by prototype and purpose. And Schenker places the arrival of this condition in the 16th century. There's a connection there back to some of the claims he was making in Geist. Section 3 again labours the point that nature provided the pattern, indeed the eternal goal for all the other arts, but goes on to develop the controlling concept of the entire essay, that of Gleichnis or likeness. Schenker says, it is a characteristic of the human mind that it can conceive the world and even itself only in terms of likeness. We call king someone who is not a subject, rich someone who isn't poor, sun that which is not moon, man that which is not woman, and so on through everything that we encounter in the world. And naturally, naturally enough, he cites the famous line from the end of Goethe's Faust to which my own title alludes. Is the text of a slightly uh, longer extract from the essay. The manner of apprehending through likeness alone is the form of our consciousness. Nature, which gave us consciousness, also gave us its form. It seemed in her own interest, therefore, that she should not block for herself her gift to us. Just as she offered herself as prototype for the arts, therefore, so thereby she placed herself as their likeness, while conversely, she appointed the arts as the likeness of herself. Prototype became likeness, nature as likeness of the arts, the arts as likeness of nature. Thus, nature, while retaining her form, imbued our consciousness with the entire content of the world and achieved thereby her original purpose through consciousness to elevate us above the entire animal kingdom. But music, for the reasons already given, was excluded from this gleichness haft relationship with nature, hence its early alliance with poetry, so that the word tone relationship became a kind of secondary likeness in the, of a, in the absence of a direct likeness to nature. 
What was to be done? Across three densely written pages, Schenker dramatizes the terrifying wrestling with an unknown secret which artists had to endure until the principle, the fundamental law of music was found. The so solution of the problem proved to be to locate likeness within music itself rather than seeking it between music and the external world. And while Schenker acknowledges the artificiality of making art the likeness of itself, he argues that nature herself was elevated thereby. He says, a new art was established artificially, as it were a distinct second artificial and higher nature. The reader of the essay is made to wait until the beginning of the section headed Über das Gleichnis selbst, on likeness itself, before the secret is finally revealed, like the rabbit from the conjurer's hat. This likeness, says Schenker, was called motive. The construction of Schenker's prose here offers a clear parallel to the equivalent, although much condensed, restatement of the argument in the first two sections of Harmonielehre. So at the top you have um, the, uh, the rabbit out of the hat in Der Weg zum Gleichnis, and underneath it uh, the paragraph ending um, from Harmonielehre, which sort of pr produce you know, the answer to the great question uh, in very much the same very much the same manner, set out in the same way. To be sure, the natural artificial distinction noted by Morgan still runs through Schenker's language here, but there seems to be a clear attempt to collapse the two terms and even to claim that the artificial nature from which music arises exceeds that of the other arts and even nature herself in some sense. Schenker goes further here in this respect than he would in Harmonielehre. On the other hand, what isn't yet present in Gleichnis is the assertion of the procreative urge of tones, which in Harmonielehre adverts to a much more comfortable accommodation with a genuine musical organicism, in my view. That development in Schenker's thinking may account for the fact that the word Gleichnis appears only a handful of times in the relevant portion of Harmonielehre, where Schenker effectively elides it with Wiederholung, repetition. Likewise, the term Wiederholung is prominent in the Geist essay, while Gleichnis is entirely absent. The chief purpose of the Gleichnis essay, then, is to theorize that term extensively in order to establish a common basis in nature for music alongside the other arts. Nevertheless, while I've been pressing the conceptual closeness of Gleichnis to Harmonielehre, it is in one important respect much closer to Geist. Having defined motive in terms of prototype on the one hand and counterpart or after image or simply likeness on the other, no likeness, no pattern, no motive, and what is even more obvious, no pattern, no likeness, he writes, Schenker continues briefly to set out the fact that motives can be melodic, rhythmic, harmonic and contrapuntal, and that likenesses need not be exact Wiederholung, that's the unique sense, use of that word in the essay, but can tolerate alteration through transposition and other means. And he sets out a few simple examples. Um, so here at the bottom of this page, you've just got, uh, and this is very obvious, and I imagine you can read it here, example from the D minor prelude from book one of the 48, and beneath it, uh, the opening of the Brahms G minor Rhapsody, uh, the, the brackets pointing out the motivic repetitions. It's, it's absolutely straightforward. In the context of the cyclic form of the sonata, as he calls it, Motivic working is sometimes also called thematicism, he says, and the term motive is accordingly replaced by theme. Then comes the following. The sum of all likenesses, all thematicism, is also commonly given the grand name organic. Now the situation here is precisely the same as that with the motivic, <coughs> i.e. with likeness itself. Just as this is but artificial in origin, without pattern in nature, and corresponds only to the form of our consciousness. Likewise, the sum of all such cannot be called anything but artificial, and consequently the stated word organic can be grasped and employed only in a free, analogical and artificial sense. If one wants to lift this word out of its proper field of reference, where it signifies the ultimate secret of nature, 
and apply it to art in order to reverence art with the highest glory of full equal standing with nature, one should meanwhile remain constantly aware that poetry, painting or sculpture deserve the description much more so than music. Music is so different from the other arts, in origin as well as in development, that that very word is least of all appropriate in any sense, let alone the literal one. This seems unequivoc unequivocally to revoke the earlier theorizing and returns us to the position adopted in Geist. On the other hand, in the very next sentence, Schenker invokes the notion of genius. Only the genius can create motivic likenesses at the highest level of perfection, and even skilled listeners often remain unaware of motivic connections. Moreover, it's not uncommon to find oneself in the situation of being unable to decide whether a motivic connection is in play or not. And Schenker reduces a couple of examples, again from the Beethoven sonatas, from the uh, E minor sonata, Opus 90 at the top, and from Opus uh, 110, the first movement of Opus 110 here. In the case of Opus 110, he asks whether Schenker, well, he asks whether Beethoven consciously crafted the relationship of upper voice and bass, the repetition of the um, GF uh, exchange there in the bass here, or whether the likeness was intended only in the upper voice of the two statements, where they're obviously uh, transposed repetitions of one another. Although he doesn't mention organicism at this point, the question of unconscious as opposed to conscious motivic working recalls the similar discussion in Geist where Schenker was prepared to accept that a particular similarity has actually arisen organically in the imagination only in as much as the composer has not intended it. And the introduction of the musical genius of this in this connection here in the Gleichnis essay seems significant in view of the role played by that concept in gra Schenker's gradual turn towards organicism, as Pastille and Cook have claimed. A further and more transparent invocation of that important passage from Geist appears in the next part of the Gleichnis essay, which Schenker initially drafted under the heading Conclusion and Transition, but subsequently retitled The Second Secondary Likeness of the Poetic. And I think it should be clear from this slide that the relevant text was first written under the, the title Schlusswort und Überleitung. Uh, that is, the text was originally intended as the Schlusswort und Überleitung, and the, the changed title was, was added later. There's a clear difference in the, in the handwriting and even the, the, the pen used, I think. This title, the second secondary likeness of the poetic, in its turn points to a very early footnote in Harmonielehre. In the main text of that publication, Schenker has just pointed out that while the discovery of the motive freed music from the need to seek prototypes from nature, it nevertheless was not denied stimu stimuli from other arts, which gave to it the associations of nature at second hand, so to speak. The footnote then promises that the means by which the secondary nature of these external associations in music, namely in program music, is expressed, will be discussed elsewhere. But that discussion is not to be found in Harmony Lehre. Thus, this retitled section in the Gleichnis essay shows us what Schenker suppressed. Schenker's argument in this section is that once the motive and its treatment had been established as the fundamental principle of its being, music could incorporate other influences and stimuli, including those drawn from real everyday life, such as bodily motion, movements of the hands, eyes, and so on. Thus, life itself, the entire expanse of human life, entered into a likeness to music. This second new likeness was obviously distinct from the prior intra-musical kind, but it allowed music from now on to nourish itself from life and from nature similarly to the other arts to which it now approached. Of course, admits Schenker, what he is talking about is, quote, that musical genre which is always inappropriately labelled program music. 
inappropriately, because all good and best music may be programme music in this sense, and indeed is, without ceasing to be artificial Künstlich music that is true music and true art, that, that is true music and true art. Here Schenker is reprising an argument which he'd already made in his 1897 essay, Impersonal Music, namely that programme music wasn't the preserve of composers such as Liszt, Berlioz and Wagner, but had been cultivated earlier and better by Bach, Haydn, Mozart and of course Beethoven, the first movement of whose A Major Piano Sonata Opus 101, Schenker here in Gleichnis calls the most sublime programme music ever achieved. Nevertheless, there were limits to what music could achieve in this respect. The important thing was for each art to be true to its own gleichness, which in the case of music meant constantly creating melodic, rhythmic, harmonic and contrapuntal likenesses. Nor was such composition of that kind to be sullied with the label of formalism. Schenker goes on to describe the obstacle faced in all arts by their being subjected to the constraints of space and time. The greatest artists, he says, are those who most appropriately solve the problem of expressing the greatest psychological freedom within the bounds of form. Such a composer was, of course, Beethoven. And Schenker takes as an example of secondary poetic likeness the first movement of the Les Adieux Sonata, Opus 81a. The very heading, he says, indicates beyond doubt that a likeness is in play but Schenker asks whether we can truly say that the opening three-note motive has really been influenced by a verbal and situational prototype or not. Are we obliged to believe Beethoven, not least because of his personal written assurance? He's referring to the fact that Beethoven underlays the, the first three notes, the G, F, E flat, with the word Liebe wohl. Um, are we obliged to believe Beethoven, not believe, least because of his personal written assurance, or are we within our rights to deny the likeness? And if we accept that a likeness exists here, how can we deny it in another case? Schenker proceeds to assert what we might call a psychology, although he himself doesn't employ that word here, a psychology of the poetic likeness in music. In short, he argues that we have to accept that music can express such likenesses and that they can exist, be real, on an individual basis to composer and listener alike. He writes, the likeness, is there provide, the likeness is there provided that it has arisen, like all association of ideas, unbidden and unwilled. Here again is a formulation that's very close to that in Geist concerning true organicism in music. It also evokes the question of the real presence, or otherwise, of motivic connections raised in the earlier part of the Gleichnis <coughs> essay, the examples from Opus 90 and 110 that I showed you a moment ago. In a remarkable paragraph, which it's difficult to imagine the later Schenker penning, he pursues his analysis of the Les Adieux Sonata by admitting that the development section conveys to him, as he puts it, the most specific impression of life. He believes he he sees and hears someone sobbing. He says, someone whose thoughts and feelings break down before they reach their end, as though he could not imagine the cruelty of farewell ever being over. The overall impression is of a completely broken person. And he conveys in musical notation roughly how he hears the passage. What you have here is uh, an extract from the beginning of the development section of the sonata in um, an image from the first edition and above it uh, Schenker's the relevant text from the, the Gleichnis essay. And what Schenker's doing is adding on the lower stave um, individual notes which complete various statements of the and obviously reformulations of the, the three note Lebewohl motive which are absent in uh, the piece itself. The piece itself, which he says contains other musical and poetic likenesses, which Schenker doesn't describe, uh, in place of the, the missing notes. Is it not as if, he asks, the first motive, the Lebewohl motive, motive, could not be completed, whether out of impotence or pain? 
And he again insists that even were he the only person to hear the passage in this way, and even if Beethoven had intended a different poetic likeness of which we are ignorant, his, Schenker's, hearing would be entirely defensible. Summing up, he posits that, one, the composer initially creates a poetic musical likeness of which the hearer is either ignorant or arrives at a different likeness. Two, conversely, the listener may evolve a poetic musical likeness when the composer intended none or a different one. From this, Schenker concludes that poetic musical likenesses have a double subjectivity, being directed toward both composer and listener. The best situation is where both discern the identical likeness, but this isn't necessary for any likeness to be deemed real. Thus, it has to be admitted that music can express more than the purely musical, the rein musikalisches, but it can do so only via the means of intramusical likenesses created through melodic, harmonic, rhythmic, and contrapuntal working. Moreover, the better that the secondary form of likeness springs up from the first, so much better is the artistic result than when, and Schenker's disdain for the program music of the post-Beethoven era resurfaces here, when poetic effusions are lined up next to one another without regard for the rules of art. And here, apart from a further approving sentence about Beethoven, which as I said earlier, may or may not be complete, the text of Gleichnis breaks off. Well, I hope that this description which I've given you of this hitherto unexplored essay has been enough to give a sense of its content and of its potential importance in enriching and extending our understanding of the development of Schenker's thought concerning the nature of music around the turn of the 20th century in the period between the publication of Geist and that of Harmonielehrer. At the very least, it enables us to see, for the first time, that the robust denunciation of musical organicism which has made Geist such a focus of attention isn't unique to that essay. On the other hand, if we agree with Corsin that Geist represents Schenker's sceptical attack on those of an organicist turn of mind who would argue for the power of the artist to create a second nature, this is precisely the claim which Schenker makes for music in theorizing the notion of Gleichnis. To reiterate, the discovery that likeness in music was to be found, at least initially, not in relation to external nature, but uniquely in relation to music itself, meant that, quote, a new art was established artificially, as it were a distinct, second, artificial and higher nature. And even if Schenker still insists on the natural artificial dichotomy that is made so plain in Geist, it's nonetheless impossible to miss the very positive spin that he is now putting on music's potential for self-replication, a potential that would come to seem all the more real to him by the time of Harmonielehrer, with its claim for the biological urges which rendered musical tones akin to living creatures. But I must be careful not to claim too much. Gleichnis doesn't show us, once and for all, as it were, how Schenker became an organicist. As I've tried to explain, it's Janus-faced, allying in important respects with ideas set out in Geist on the one hand, while also presaging the opening pages of Harmonielehrer on the other. Indeed, its evident preliminary relationship to that later text means that we must revise Ian Bent's suggestion that Gleichnis, along with the other for Formenlehrer materials in file 83 of the Oster collection, dates from 1907 or thereafter. William Drabkin has pointed out that Harmonielehrer was largely finished by the spring of 1905, which clearly suggests a terminus postquem known for Gleichnis, but I'm as yet unable to assign it a more exact date. I suppose it's not beyond the bounds of possibility that it even predates Geist, but I, I think in view of its content that is highly unlikely. It does not appear to be mentioned in Schenker's diary, nor in any correspondence of which I'm aware. It's not impossible that its origins lie chronologically closer to Geist and to Schenker's pre-1900 writings than to the text, Harmonielehrer, of which it's such a clear precursor. Other questions abound. I said this was work in progress. One, which might itself have some bearing on the date of the essay, concerns the fact that the text of Gleichnis, as some of you may have noticed, is written in Roman script 
rather than Schenker's more us usual Korrentschrift, which uh, one advantage of which is it makes it much easier to read, as I'm sure you agree. Uh, I'm aware of, I'm puzzled by this, I'm aware of other, some other documents in the Auster collection that similarly use Roman rather than Korrent, but whether this points to a chronological link between them or, or has some other implication isn't yet clear to me. Another question concerns the very word Gleichnis, which, despite its wide range of meanings in German, isn't, as far as I know, routinely used in the sense in which Schenker employs it, particularly in relation to motivic repetition and imitation in music. As I've mentioned, Gleichnis, the word Gleichnis, is entirely absent from the text of Geist, where Schenker prefers the more usual Wiederholung. And as I've also pointed out, the incidences of the word Gleichnis in that part of Harmonielehre, which is derived from the Gleichnis essay, are few and far between, compared to its ubiquitousness there. In Harmonielehre, as in Geist, the term Wiederholung is once again the preferred term. What then motivated Schenker to develop this argument concerning artistic and natural likeness at this particular point? His introduction of the word in the third section of the essay, uh, quote, it's a characteristic of the human mind that it can conceive the world and even itself only in terms of likeness, we call king someone who is not a subject, I used that quote earlier, is reminiscent of Schopenhauer's remark that, in fact, all concept formation rests fundamentally upon likenesses, inasmuch as it springs from the grasping of similarities in things and the dropping of dissimilarities. Perhaps, too, he might have encountered Nietzsche's use of Symbol and Gleichnis in The Birth of Tragedy, although, as Wayne Klein claims, while Nietzsche uses both those terms in reference to image or its equivalent, uh, a reference to image or its equivalent. The word Gleichnis is never used by Nietzsche in connection with music. Music is always symbolisch, never Gleichnisartig. I might also mention here that the very title of this essay, Der Weg zum Gleichnis, turns up in Jean Paul's, Paul Richter's Vorschule der Ästhetik as part of a discussion of metaphor. But what, if anything, to make of um, all of this, I'm as yet very uncertain. Then there's the question of the possible purpose of the Gleichnis text. We should remember that the current organization of the Ernst Oster collection in various files is largely the work of Schenker's widow Ginetta. It's true that two of the last three unpaginated sheets which are preserved with the 36-page continuous text of Gleichnis bear the pencil annotation form in Schenker's hand in the top left corner, and you can see that faintly in, in pencil there. But despite that, we shouldn't perhaps automatically assume that the essay was initially conceived as being part of the Neue Formenlehre project, particularly if, as seems unequivocal, it dates from no later than 1905. And even if it was so intended, that doesn't mean that it might not initially have served some more immediate purpose. And this brings me back to Geist and the publisher's note. It's meant to be blank that this was just part of a larger work that was still in manuscript. Commentators on Geist have long been keen to speculate on what, if anything, this larger work may have been. Cook is enti entirely convinced of this broader context. All one can really say, he says, is that if there was in fact such a larger work, then it's lost. Helmut Federhofer, on the other hand, invokes an 1894 postcard from Hanslick to Schenker to bolster the claim that Geist may have been part of a larger work on the history of melody, a Geschichte der Melodie, uh, which Hanslick mentions, a claim which Kevin Corsin, for one, finds plausible. Might we not entertain the possibility, though, that the Gleichnis essay, related in various ways as it is to Geist, might itself be part of the mysterious larger work? This last suggestion is in fact more than mere idle speculation on my part. Although most commentators cite only the publisher's note concerning the larger work of which Geist is supposedly a fragment, Schenker himself apparently makes reference to it at the beginning of the penultimate paragraph of section three of Geist, and Pastille's translation of the essay curiously glosses over the relevant words. Schenker writes, to put it frankly here, I intend in the detailed work to make an attempt at explaining harmonic and contrapuntal prescriptions and proscriptions. And the words that Pastille leaves out are in the detailed work. And his intentions, 
Schenker's intentions continue into the final paragraph of this section. He says, because I will explain the nature of harmonic and contrapuntal prescriptions almost solely in terms of their psychological origins and impulses, I also hope to bring what are called the disciplines of harmony and counterpoint into a welcome proximity to free composition, that is, to the actual life of music. And these disciplines, once clarified, would be able both to explain the expressions of free composition and to prepare students to express themselves. Framed thus, Schenker's plan resonates closely with the opening sentence of the foreword to Harmonielehre, where he immediately states that the present work is an attempt to construct a bridge, a genuine and practical, practicable bridge between composition and theory. One thinks too of the subtitle of the second volume, published in 1922, of Contrapunkt, with its reference to bridges to free composition. You begin with some freien Satz. In short, the detailed work to which Schenker alludes in Geist would appear to be nothing other than the major theoretical project which spanned his career, from Harmonielehre through Contrapunkt to the Posthumus der Freiersatz of 1935, and to which he gave the umbrella title Neue Musikalische Theorien und Fantasien. If you want to, you know, it's the old adage, if you want to hide something, do it in plain sight of everybody. If I'm right, then, the larger work is anything but lost. And inasmuch as, as we've seen, the Gleichnis text is a precursor to the opening sections of Harmonielehre, we can certainly identify it, if not Geist itself, as part of that larger work still in manuscript. Indeed, the very fact that the final section of Gleichnis is headed both conclusion and transition unmistakably implies some larger context. One final thought. The publisher's note appended to Geist further reveals that the text had been read at a meeting of the Philosophical Society of the University of Vienna. Kevin Corson, in his 2009 piece, emphasizes the authority and significance of that body, its list of speakers reading, as he puts it, like a who's who of fin de siècle Vienna. Corson also observes that Schenker's lecture was the first in the history of the society to be devoted exclusively to music. Indeed, there was a strong scientific component to the society and its lectures, with a bias towards psychology and physiology in even some of the lectures on aesthetic topics. In light of all this, Corsin suggests of Geist, Schenker's decision to frame his project in psychological terms was probably very carefully considered. Schenker didn't lecture to the Philosophical Society again, though, as was customary, a separate second meeting was devoted to a discussion of Geist. Nonetheless, there's evidence that he did give other public lectures, for example, to the Vienna chapter of the Internationale Musikgesellschaft in the autumn of 1902, though I've not been able to discover the subjects of uh, that or other lectures. It's at least worth asking, though, I think, whether Gleichnis, the surviving part of which is commensurate in length and structure to those of Geist, which we know was an um, a, a oral lecture at one stage, might itself have been drafted initially for public oral delivery, and whether the careful distancing of music from true natural organicism, Morgan's term, in both, both texts was a considered rhetorical strategy on Schenker's part, crafted in deference to his expected audience. For we all, to some extent, play to our audience. Corsin even points out that Schenker would have been aware that some members of the audience for Geist held the keys to any potential professorship at the University of Vienna, a position Schenker never achieved, but to which he certainly aspired. As Schenker delivered Geist in 1895, the search to replace Hanslick whose famous text lurks just behind the foreground of Gleichnis, I think, at the University of Vienna, was already underway. It would end in 1898 with the appointment of Adler. In later years, Schenker, that professional outsider, as I like to think of him, would of course routinely pour scorn on what we would call the professoriate. Still, he was at least courteous to his former pupil, Felix Eberhard von Kuber, when the latter achieved that promotion. Writing on the 1st of June, 1927, Schenker sent his best wishes on behalf of himself and his wife and went on, The grace of God is, of course, more than the grace of professors, but the world relies on professors, as it surely has to, since God remains invisible and inaudible to it. 
you are thus doing the right thing to take up your credentials. And I only hope that I am too. Thank you. Yeah.